<clears throat> Page 12. Oh, marching my lasso again. I'm marching my lasso Om Mother Machi, to you I pray. Om Mother Machi, to you I pray. Om Mother Machi, to you I pray. Empower me through the white om. Empower me through the red ah. Empower me through the blue hung. Transmit to me your enlightened body, speech, and mind. May I attain your realization and perfect wisdom. So here we have the Om Ah Hung that's in more or less every tantric or Vajrayana sadhana or deity reenactment where we reenact the autobiography of the <clears throat> archetype or deity, the meditation deity, the Buddha. In fact, this prayer has come from the historical master, the matriarch, the lineage master, Machig Labdran, who lived around the 12th century who is a disciple of Milarepa's contemporary Padampasanjay, the Buddha of Tingri, of Mount Everest. And Machig, when she was dying, her only son, her main disciple, surrounded by other disciples, asked her on her deathbed, Mother, how can we pray to you? How can we receive your blessings when you're gone? Don't leave us. What will we do without you? How can we pray to you? Kind of like we are when we're parted from our guru or from God even. Rumi's, all Rumi's poems are about that. And uh, she said to her son and to the, all the disciples, who are really each of them like her only child, which is the relationship that people have in the Vajrayana with their teachers, she said, pray like this. Om, mother, to you I pray. Ah, om, to you I pray, receiving you, your body, Vajra body blessings into my Vajra body, transforming me, awakening my body as the Sangha, as the Buddha embodiments, as Tulku or Namanakaya, perfect embodiment in this world. Om, white, Om, red, ah, from your throat chakra to my throat chakra, transmitting your Sambhogakaya speech blessings to me, transforming me into the expression of Dharma, Sambhogakaya. Blue, hung, heart to heart, transmission, spiritual resuscitation. From your heart, Dharmakaya, blue like the sky, to me, awakening my heart mind. So awakening my Buddha, speak, my Buddha body, Buddha speech, and Buddha mind to be like you, empowering me, as it says here, transmitting. So may I attain realization like you of your transcendental wisdom, prajna paramita, transconceptual wisdom, universal metta wisdom, overarching, underpinning, gnosis. Cosmic mind, what word can we use? May I realize your Buddha mind and mine are inseparable, ever inseparable. So that's this prayer. It's one of my favorite prayers and practices. It's a core practice of the Chud or ego cutting or Chud Prajna Paramita, the transcendental wisdom lineage. Also comes with beautiful tunes, and there's more elaborate should practices and so on we could go into. But I think it's a great Dakini practice for our times, for the time of the um, feminine wisdom to, I don't want to say arise, how about to um, establish its true place in the world. And then on to the, perhaps the most popular 
I'll call it long, which in Tibetan Buddhism would be a joke, but long prayer, long to us, short to Tibetan, and prayer, the seven-line prayer, supplication of the Lotus Guru Padmasambhava representing that enlightenment within our own spiritual blossoming as the lotus opens and reveals the Buddhaness within Padmasambhava, born, lotus born, born in a lotus, Buddha born in that unfolding of our spiritual wings already in our heart, in the original goodness of the natural great perfection, the Buddha nature, Tathagata Garbha. Ung Bless and empower us so we may be just like you. Love, she says, so. Lotus Guru, Masi, embodying all the Buddhas. Om Ah Hung. Om Ah Hung. Benza Guru Pamasi. Guru Yoga, union with the ultimate. Om Ah Through devotion to the relative teacher, Guru. Pemasi, the Buddha's representative, door to Buddha. Om Benza Guru Pema, Buddha, teacher and practitioner one. Ah Benza Guru Pemasi, one and inseparable, the real meaning of Guru Yoga or devotion. Om Ah Benza Guru Pema. May your heart, mind, and mind remain inseparable. Lotus Guru, empower us all. Transmit your wisdom, love, and compassion to us. Your dynamic energy and liberating Buddha activity to each of us. So we may become just like you, a light in the world. A Buddha, a Bodhisattva, an awakener, an edifier. Benza Guru Pema Siddhi, a wise elder, spiritual leader, servant leader. Ama Hum Benza Guru Pema Siddhi, a compassionate altruist. Ama Hum Benza Guru Pema Siddhi, spiritual activist. And uphold the lineage of living love. The embodiment of wisdom in action. Om Ah Benza Guru Pema Si. The Dzogchen lineage of the natural innate great perfection. Om Ah Hum Benza Guru Pema Si. Om Om Benza Guru Pema. Seeing the Buddhaness, the Buddha nature, the light in everyone and everything. Om Ah Hum Ben Zang Guru Pema Siddhi Om Om Ben Zang Guru Pema. A radiant display 
of the great completeness, the divine state, heaven on earth, nirvana and samsara inseparable, the great com com perfection. Ahom Bhamsa Guru Pema Sudhi Hom 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 Bhamsa Guru Pema Sudhi Hom Hom Guru Pema Sudhi Buddha's blessings ever awaken and illumine our minds. May the enlightened one's blessing and inspiration ever unfold in our hearts. May the inconceivable blessing of enlightenment itself, of awakening itself, dispel the momentary illusion we've ever been separate, incomplete, or apart. Always a part of, not apart from. Homage to the innate great perfection. May all realize it and be <laughs> delighted by it. In my home. Now beginning with breathing, as always, breathing is a very important Buddhist practice. <laughs> Inhaling deeply, filling up, feeling it. And exhaling and releasing. <sighs> Inhaling, filling up, feeling it viscerally, somatically, in your lower belly, hara, navel chakra. And exhaling and releasing. And for the third time, last time, now let's really do it. Inhaling, filling up, feeling it, holding it a moment, intensifying, holifying, harmonizing, concentrating. Hold the breath, hold the mind in the navel chakra. Stop the breath, stop the mind, stop the world. Rest in the central channel, the center of the turning wheel of the universe. Mahashunyata, the vast shining void, the great middle way, the axle of the entire wheel. The axis, the unmoved axis of the turning wheel. And releasing, ah. And one more last time, I lied to you. Inhaling deeply and filling up, second holding. And releasing, ah. And now really for the last time, that was just practice to warm up, now let's do it. Inhaling deeply, filling up, second holding. See if you can relax into it, holding and releasing, letting be at the same time, not letting go of the breath, letting be. Settling into it, floating on that ocean of prana, of subtle energy, sitting on the breath. And releasing, ah, mm, how sweet it is. It's getting, getting hot in here. And letting everything go. Decontracting, releasing, letting go, relaxing, letting be. (sighs) 
opening into the natural great perfection of things left just as they are. Openness and awareness, inseparable relaxation and dynamic presence, dynamic attention, simultaneous. Just sitting, just breathing, just being awareful, wakeful, attentive, mind, the mind, awareness transparent to itself. See through yourself, seeing Buddha, being Buddha, as it is right now. The Tao of nowness, natural body, natural breath and energy, and third, natural mind. Let go, let come and go, let be, that's the secret. Letting be as it is. This breath, as if the only breath, this moment, truly the only moment, incandescently present, nowness awareness, awareness alone, Rikpa, Neluk, the natural state, the Buddha mind, Buddha's meditation, natural meditation. Yes.
Get ready, I'm going to shout, Pat! Now look, turn towards yourself. Who, what, is startled, is shocked, is vibrating? Who is experiencing? Intuit directly, no need to think and analyze. Who, what, is experiencing right now? Turn towards the subject. Make the subject into the object of your attention. Instead of looking outward, look inward at the subject. Who, what, is experiencing, is hearing, is thinking, is trying to meditate or control the mind? Who is feeling physical sensations in the body? Who is it? What is it? How is it? Where is it? If you don't know, just be don't know for a moment. That could be transformative rather than our usual fallacious knowledge and self-concept. Who or what is it experiencing right now? Abruptly pop the question and let go. No need to analyze right now. Plump the bottomless abyss between thoughts, preconceptual. Bottomless abyss, luminous, scentless openness, mahashunyata. The shining void, the groundless ground of being. Transpersonal, transconceptual, transrealescent. Our true identity, the Buddha nature. Infinite openness, infinite awareness, inseparable. Now it's your turn. One, two, three, pet! One, two, three, pet! One, two, three, pet! Now look, turn towards the source of all the radiance, all the projections. Who, what is experiencing right now? And settle thus into thusness, isness, beingness alone. Not even being yourself, just being luminous, scentless openness. The natural state, the natural Buddha, the natural heart mind of the great perfection.
Precious Lama La Sola Dep Sendi Ne Luk Topa Shinki La May Your Heart Mind and Mind Hours Remain Inseparable for the Limitless Benefit of One and All Kuntazampo Long Champa Kempo Me Kuntazampo Long Champa Kempo We On page 15 for the completion prayers His Holiness Drukchen Rinpoche's Prayer from his long prayer, my crazy autobiographical tale. I call on you, my teachers, regard me with compassion. I sincerely wish to receive your blessings. Please regard your child. Please bless me with the resolve to attain realization. Please bless me to have a steady and smooth mind so that for this life and those to follow, as a true practitioner whose heart and mind are in accord, special intention to help others is spontaneously present. May I be able to benefit measureless beings without the toxic stains of a competitive mind, without the intoxicating liquor of anger and lust, be able to practice the peaceful and soothing Dharma through listening, thinking, and examining, especially about those teachings I practice. May I be able to precisely determine their meaning. Raising the victorious banner of ultimate practice, may I be able to accomplish great service to the Dharma and beings. This is the way I pray all the time, and I request all of you to support my prayers. This is the way I pray all the time, and I request all of you to support all my prayers. So someone asked about bodhicitta at the end of the last session, the difference between that and metta, loving kindness. If you look at the end of this first paragraph, here we have a little expression of the master. I mean, all of this is the master's bodhicitta, or altruistic, unselfish, altruistic, compassionate aspiration for universal enlightenment. But the last few lines especially, as a true practitioner whose heart and mind are in harmony, the special intention, that's the bodhicitta, the special intention, not the ordinary selfish wish to be comfortable or safe or happy, the special intention, the, high asp the noble aspiration to help others is spontaneously present. That's, in general, the bodhicitta, the relative bodhicitta, the altruistic intention, the compassionate wish to help others externally and internally, in every way, mentally, physically, emotionally, psychologically, materially, whatever. Protection, love, whatever we can share with them. May I be able to benefit beings without number, numberless beings. Now on page 22 and 23, on 23, bottom, the bodhicitta, bodhisattva's dedicating of the merits, a good little prayer practice for the end of the session. Jancha sancha krimpa che makye panang ke gyoche ke panam pa me pa ya kane kandu pa washa May the pure, brilliant sun of bodhicitta dawn in each and every heart and mind, dispelling the darkness of suffering and confusion unstoppably until all are illumined and awakened. And above that, ge wa de ye nyo de da da pa chen pa dra pja ne dra wa che cha ma le pa de ye sa la ngo pa sho. By this virtuous practice, may we swiftly realize and fully embody the natural great perfection, and thereby bring all without exception to its complete realization. And on page 22, 
By the power of this virtuous practice, may the real enemies, our own projections and misdeeds be overcome, and ultimate vision fully attained so we may free beings from the miseries of birth, old age, disease, and death, the stormy waves of the ocean of samsara. So as we're entering into the Dzogchen practice, I'd like to read to, from you, to, to you from the main seminal principal Dzogchen master, a short, delightful quote. The master Longchenpa, who lived in the 1400s, the master of masters. This is from the book Old Man Basking in the Sun, translated by Keith Dowman of Longchempa's Teachings. If you like to study such books, Old Man Basking in the Sun, translated by Keith Dowman. I think this is relevant. I'd like to pass this on to each of you as we undertake this delightful, meaningful Dzogchen practice retreat. Longchempa in the 14th century, author of 250 books and tomes, many of whom he wrote in a, his, in a cave. And yet, so up to date, he says, so stay right here, you lucky people. Let go and be happy in the natural state. Let your complicated life and everyday confusion alone, leave it alone. And in the quietude, doing nothing, watch the splendid, marvelous, magical nature of mind. This piece of advice is from the bottom of my heart, the old man known as doing nothing, nothing left over. Fully engage in contemplation until understanding and liberation is born. Cherish non-attachment and equanimity and watch contraction and delusion dissolve. And forming no agenda at all, that means no hopes and anxiety, no fear, no hopes and expectation, no fear and anxiety, forming no agenda at all, reali watch reality dawn. Whatever occurs, Whatever it may be, that itself is the key. That, friends, is a radical meditation instruction. Whatever occurs, whatever it may be, that itself is the key. And without stopping it or nourishing it, in an even flow, freely resting, nakedly aware, surrender to ultimate contemplation. In this naked, pristine purity of awareness, we reach ultimate consummation. Do we have that? Can you put that on the board, or do you need to copy it from my scrap here? We'll try to put this on the board. I don't know where I get these things. I must have torn it out on the Reader's Digest on the way here in the airplane. They just keep coming. How many meditation teachers will tell us you have to calm the mind and clear the mind? And we sit there trying to stop thinking and going crazy. You have not heard me say calm the, mind, calm the mind or clear the mind. We don't have to stop thinking. This is not just redecorating our prison cell. We're not just moving the deck chairs around on the Titanic, trying to feel better, how temporary. Repaint the walls of our prison cell, fight for a better berth on the Titanic before it goes down. No. Whatever occurs, whatever it may be, that itself is the key. 
and without stopping it, suppressing it, or nourishing it, indulging it in an even flow, freely resting, naked aware, nakedly aware, surrendering to this ultimate contemplation, naked, pristine purity, awareness alone, reaching consummation. Not manipulating and fabricating special states of mind, all states are temporary and therefore unreliable, relying only on the united state of mind, the natural state, as it is, which is not a state, which is not temporary. We'll get more into that when we discuss the view, meditation, and action of the great perfection and swooping down from above with the view while climbing up from below through relative practices according to our inclination and um, aspirations. The Dzogchen practice is joyous. That imaho is the shortest Dzogchen teaching. Imaho, which literally means wonder or wondrous delight. Hard to translate these exclamations of yogic joy, like Eureka. How do you translate Eureka? When they found gold in Eureka, California, they named it, you know, it became Eureka. But the, the explana- exclamation came first. Then they named the place Eureka. How do you translate Eureka? or any of the words that we use in that way. Whoa, what does that mean? Wow, how do you translate it? Eureka. Swaha, at the end of mantras, like in, in Sanskrit mantras and so on, or Om, the cosmic sound. How do you translate these Yiddish terms into English? You lose something in the translation. Imaho, wondrous delight, imaho. Fantastic, marvelous, far out, imaho, the shortest Dzogchen teaching, expressing the wonder of this momentary arising, this magical display of the primordial Buddha field of Kuntazampo, the great perfection, the radiant vision of everything perfect as it is, beyond good and bad. It's not that there isn't a lot of shit going on in the world. There is. And we have to deal with it in a relative way. Thus, the relative bodhicitta of well-wishing to become better people and contribute to a better world. And yet there is the absolute vision of the ultimate bodhicitta in which everything fits is a lawful unfolding just as it is. The great acceptance, nirvanic peace in things just left as they are, as Buddha said. And that acceptance has its own positively transformative magic. Things do get better. That way. Buddha said under the Bodhi tree, according to the Zen scriptures, when I was awakened, enlightened, all were awakened, even the rocks and the trees. Doesn't that resonate? If it's too obscure, let me retranslate it. When I am clear, clear, everything is clearer. That's the secret of spiritual enlightenment, spiritual awakening. Not just to see different things, to see things differently. When I am clear, everything is clear, or at least clearer. Let's not over-idealize clearer. It says in the Jewish wisdom scripture, the Talmud, to save one soul is to save the whole world. That's the purpose of awakening. The whole world, the whole of samsara is within one's own mind. Buddha doesn't see samsara. Buddha sees Buddha in everybody and everything. That's the sacred vision we can unfold through this great perfection practice, relying on the innate wholeness and completeness, seeing things as they are, not as we would like them to be, seeing things as they are, not as we are. Clear vision, right view, clear vision, the first step on the Noble Eightfold Path. Clear vision, right view, not opinion, but darshan, divine audience. In Tibetan Tawa, the view. In Sanskrit, darshan, seeing God, not just having the right opinion that God exists. That's a belief. Darshan is the direct experience of it. That's the first step on the Eightfold Path. Sama Samditi, right view, clear vision, seeing things as they are, not as they ain't. That's what meditation and introspective awareness and this kind of combination of concentration, insight, leading to natural awareness meditation brings. And sooner rather than later, not in the next life, not after many lifetimes of schlepping to enlightenment, as some traditions teach. 
enlightenment now, enlightenment in this life. In the Dzogchen text, it's, last night I mentioned that Milarepa took 16 years in his cave. Well, maybe he was a slow learner. He had a lot of bad karma to clean up. He didn't have a modern media, texting and so forth. Microwaves, he had to cook himself and collect the wood. It took longer to cook his karma seeds. We have micro, modern media, mind-to-mind -mind transmission, modern, the microwave of Dzogchen view incubating the Dzogchen meditation and bringing about the spontaneous Buddha activity. We have, thanks to those forebears who invented those things, as it were, invented. Of course, he had teachers, too, who he received it from, who brought it from India, his father, Marpa, who brought it from India, from the Ropa, and so forth, all the way back to the primordial Buddha right now. I mean, back then. Sorry, it gets confusing. Imaho, joy. It's the yogic joy. It's what I mentioned last night in the inner ten S's, the new ten S's. Sattvas, uplifting spiritual energy. Energy spirit is ecstatic, not static. Not depressing, not grim. You know, just because John Dean doesn't want us to have eye contact doesn't mean you have to walk around like feeling down all the time. Just keep your gaze with deep, deeper, not just trying to meet new people, make new friends and influence people here. In the rest of the world, yes. Smile at the people on the bus or the subway, yes. But here, we're doing a different practice, just for now. Practicing alone together. Be alone with your practice in the Dharma. Be alone with God. You can meet new people and make new friends any other time. Befriend yourself here. That will suffuse the rest of the, your life and the rest of the year, I guarantee it. I'm not joking. Imaho the shortest Dzogchen teaching, as every Dzogchen master will agree. It's a marvelous teaching. It often begins in the um, spontaneous songs of enlightenment or comes in pithy instructions, personal instructions. So this morning, this afternoon, whenever we are, this afternoon in this session, we began and ended with a little chanting, the main part, the non-conceptual naked awareness, natural meditation practice with the basic principles of just sitting, just breathing, just being aware, the three pillars of natural meditation. Introducing the Dzogchen Tregjud practice, Tregjud, the main practice of Dzogchen, cutting through. Literally, Tregjud means chopping to pieces, cutting through. Chopping to pieces. Cutting through is the great Buddhist pioneer Chögyam Trungpa's coinage, cutting through. Tregjud. Chopping to pieces. Chopping what? Cutting through solidity. Cutting through concepts. Cutting through dualism, such as self and other. Me and the world. God and man, human. Good and bad. Mine and yours. Liking and disliking. Cutting through. Really seeing through those things, because there's really nothing to cut through and no one to cut, cut it. Seeing through really means being through and through. Thus modeled or reenacted in the Dzogchen sadhana Dzogchen of Tregchud practice of just being through and through in every moment, whatever arises as it, as the Master said in the quote I read. This is deep stuff. That's why it's called advanced teachings, secret teachings in Tibet. Cutting through, seeing through, just being through and through, not relying on doings and creating and fabricating special states of mind. Even calm and peace are just special states of mind, very temporary. But relying on the natural state, the united state, the great perfection, as it is. Whatever arises, that's it. The greatest show on earth, the only show in town. And you have the best seat in the house right here, on your Buddha seat, in your hara, in your navel chakra, whatever. Here, you've got it. You know what it is. Don't look elsewhere. Don't compare yourself to the person next to you. They may look good, but you have no idea what's going on inside. Don't compare yourself to the person in front of the room for the same reason. Or to the Buddha. The Buddha outside is not the real Buddha. You have no idea what's going on with them. Treg should. Dzogchen practice, actually, there are three main practices 
Rushen Tregchud and Togel, Rushen, the Zogchen Foundation, a preliminary settled discernment. Tregchud, cutting through or seeing through or being through, and Togel, leap over or being there or starting from the top, the visionary practice of Zogchen. So when you read books, you'll know, if I don't give you the original term, you get all different definitions. You think we're talking about different things. Rushen, subtle discernment, the Nundra, or foundation practice of Dzogchen itself. Tregchud, cutting through. What Nam Kai Norbu and Pichain, his brilliant book is called Contemplation. To distinguish it from ordinary meditation, like concentration, thought wiping, and other kinds of meditation. And Togyal, being there, leap over, the visionary practice. Mainly we're concentrating here in this week practice on Tregchud number two, which Christopher will circle. Cutting through, being through, seeing through. Naked awareness practice, openness and awareness inseparable, natural meditation, Tregchud. Tomorrow I'll introduce the sky gazing, the way of Tregchud meditation, posture gazes and so on. But uh, we've been talking about the natural meditation, the three pillars, natural body, natural breath and energy, and third natural heart mind as the basic structure or support for this natural state. This afternoon I introduced in the middle as a tune-up, partly because some of us are a little sleepy or dozy. You know, the afternoon session is always known in the meditation biz as the siesta session. So instead of telling jokes and stories like it says here in my notes, you know, in my notes of how to do public speaking from John Dean, it says, you know, we start with a joke because a smile is the shortest distance between two people and all these things that he, he tore out of the book about public speaking. But instead of that, we just, you know, tune up with our Zochen imahos and, you know, our Vajrasafa ha 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 hoes and, you know, our little tricks and pointers such as shouting pet, pet, the cutting word pet in the middle. Now, I being a softy, being the good cop, I you know, warned you before I shouted, but that still made a few of you levitate. But I didn't want to have any heart attacks. I see a lot of geriatric cases in the front row, probably with artificial hearts and, you know, I mean, whatever you know, pacemakers, or I don't know what you have in there, you know, so I wonder sometimes. Uh, you know, I don't want to scare anybody. I used to just shout, and then a very kindly Vipassana teacher, Fred Von Allman, who was one of my oldest Dharma friends, he was sitting in the front row sometime, and he had heard me do it, but he, he almost, he says he almost had a heart attack. He didn't mean literally. He meant on behalf of the other, some older people there, he was so worried that he made me promise not to do that anymore, because I'm so big and loud. That's, this is what the kindly teacher said, my friend Fred. Because you're so big and loud, you should really like, be compassionate to, you know, in case you have any older people there who have bad hearts or something. So we do this very softly, but yourself, you should shout it very loud and see if you can surprise and startle yourself into a new way of seeing a being. Which you can, surprisingly. Because you think, how can I... Surprise, I mean, I should let you ask the questions, but there's no time. How, you think, how can I surprise myself by asking the question? Who is experiencing? Well, shouting pet. How can I surprise myself? You try it. And you're allowed to do it more than once in a session. You try it. Because we think everything we do is premeditated, that we know what we're doing, and so on. You think you know who's in charge around here. But actually, it's very questionable. You see, check it out. I mean, sometimes I do it and, you know, I think, oh, I'm falling asleep, I better do something. And then I go, pet, and then I go back to sleep. But, you know, sometimes it just kind of bubbles up, you see a little stickiness, you go, pet! And you go, ah! <laughs> you get something that you hadn't, you know, that you didn't expect. Because life is a mystery. We think we're in charge, we think we know what we're doing. It's just so questionable, that level of thinking. It's just thought. It's not reality. You can surprise yourself. And it brings a whole fresh air, fresh wave. It's like, oh, I haven't been outside all day. I've been, I don't know, you know, hacking into the DOD with my laptop and I don't want to stop because I've always almost got to the codes. 
Well, you know, I'm not going to decide. Anyway, why should I take lunch break? I just keep going. You know, I've only been on for two days. I'm almost there. No, sometimes, you know, you get up and you go outside and it's like <sighs> a breath of fresh air. Anybody ever experienced that? You've forgotten what fresh air is like and why you do it and why you need lunch break, why you need weekend, why you need vacation. Then you're much fresher. You can come back and finish hacking into DOD and getting your codes or whatever you're doing. I just see, you know. John Dean over there, who's a computer guy, so I know what's going on in his, no? <laughs> He's teasing. You know, the obsessive things that we do, like me with my book writing. I go, oh, I haven't been outside all day. Oh, never mind. I'll just, I'll just look at the infinite space in this room. <laughs> More obsession for another few hours. That's why I have a dog. You need to have a dog. If you don't have to go outside, at least the dog does. <laughs> And that forces you to. And then things flow more easily. <laughs> Crappy as they may seem. So that's, we have these little tricks and tips and pointers. And shouting pet is a, pet is a great one. Pronounce pet like that. Sometimes if you, have the, if you have the challenge of reading Tibetan books in English, you'll see it's spelled P-H-A-T, like the fat farm. P-H-A-T, that's pronounced pet. It's hard to spell these foreign things. Yes, I'm sorry. But that's how it's pronounced, like pet. But not just pet, it's like pet, like as sharp as you can. Less than one syllable. Pet is like one and a half syllables. More like pet. See if you can, you know, and you startle yourself. And then you look who or what is experiencing. And relax and let go and drop into luminous openness, not knowing, just being. If it works. It's like if the light's off in the room, you flick the switch. The light goes on. If you're in Rigpa, if you're in naked awareness, you don't need to do this to get back to the natural state. But when you're not, then you need to flick the switch, like flicking the switch. When the light's on, you don't need to keep flicking the switch. So if this little practice works for you, use it. If not, something else will. Because everything that's happening is it anyway. We just have to tune into that. As I like to say in Dzogchen practice, just remember this, you can't miss. That's how big the view is. It's like playing basketball with a hoop that's bigger than the whole court. You can't miss. Any questions, please? Yes, Peter. Hi, nice to see you. It's good to be back. Would you ta say a little more about the seven line supplication? Uh, I think the first, as I read, the first six lines... Page one. Page one. Look like it's a... It doesn't give us much how to do. The last line says, can we be like you? Mm -hmm. Could you give a, a little more guidance in what right. that means? Thank well, you. first of it, uh, you're, you're um, just reading the translation, but in the Tibetan, every line has a uh, symbol at the end that says it's a, a revelation. It's a special kind of, um, it's, you know, mark. So it's considered that every line is redolent of blessings and transmission. So we don't really chant it for the meaning. Let me give you an example. If you read in English, I know you're, you're a very Christian kind of soul. If you read at the beginning of, um, I don't know, maybe it's the Gospel of, Mar of John, in the beginning was the Word. It, in, in, in the original language, it says logos. What a weak translation is the, is the word, hmm? Excuse me? Okay, very good. You see how smart you are? Right. So I heard, anyway, some people translate that as logos. Because these are all just translations. In the beginning was, how about in the beginning was the Om? See, this is revelation. This is not like a history. This is what could and should have been. This is a description. In the beginning is vibration. 
In the beginning is the light, and from that, everything, well, shadows occur. This is not his chronological, historical. So something like that, that's what these Terman mark means at the end of the Tibetan on the right side. You can see there's little, um, it's kind of like a percent sign. So we don't really read this for the meaning so much as you chant it and you invoke and you, you know, receive and you breathe in and breathe out the guru blessings, you know, Buddha, guru, and self are one. That's the idea. So you sort of reenact that process by first imagine, you know, praying to him as if he's out there and then beaming him in and then you know, being, one with, being one before even, it's, it's like reunion, not just union of two separate things. So that's the first thing to say. The second thing to say is, this is a Tibetan prayer, and the story is it was originally sung by the Dakinis on the roof of the monastery in a lightning storm to their guru, Padmasambhava, to help liberate them in some situation. So again, it's not, you know, so it's kind of like uh, calling up something, you know, like a number. Somebody's telephone number is really totally impersonal. It has nothing to do with them, but eventually you know it by heart because it represents them, right? The phone company puts it out there. It's just a meaningless number. But it comes, or, or the URL of your website, or the logo, or the cross, the six, whatever. Those are just the algorithm or the, the, the signpost pointing at the moon. Not the moon itself. The finger pointing at the moon. So they just to say... You know, you, Padmasambhava, who were, it's kind of like a little praise, it's kind of like exoterically, it's a prayer. You, great one, who were born, who were like self-sprung, that's what lotus means. In other words, the primordially pure self-sprung, the unborn, Dharmakaya, renowned, that's why you're renowned as lotus-born, because people can't understand words like unborn Dharmakaya, nor can I. But born in a lotus, or in Jesus' case, immaculate conception, Anybody ever read the Buddha story? How was Buddha born, my friends? Anybody remember? Yeah, at, out of Mahamaya's side. It's not that different, you see? An unusual, a pure, an immaculate birth or something. I mean, that's the idea in the mythological era of 2,000 years ago. So you, this is 2,000 years old, this kind of prayer. You're encompassed by vast retinues of the complementary energies beyond male and female by, so you see, it's just like describing him, like, I, I don't know, in, in your Valentine's Day to your wife, your ex-wife, okay. Maybe you used to say something like that, you know, oh, beautiful, I don't know. You know, beautiful and beloved, only love graced by a halo of, you know, golden curls, you, will you be my Valentine? That's what comes at the end. You know, by emulating, may we too awaken. Like Guru Rinpoche, will you be my valentine? <laughs> Don't scratch me with your mustache, merge with me. See what I'm saying? Don't merely stand aside, like merge with me. May I realize that within myself, the self-arisen Buddhiness of everything that I am. So it's like that. If you really want to know about this, read Tukutunda Brimpache's little red book that you can get somewhere. I forget what it's called. I think it's called The Outer, Inner, and Secret Meanings of a Seven-Line Prayer. Of course, it's hard to read because he's a Tibetan explaining this in English. He, he lives in America, but this is very esoteric stuff. In fact, I'm surprised that a Zen master like you is asking me about this. Usually, he asks me something much more Zen. Like, should I go up the trail and sit in the a mountain lion's cave and wait for him to come to test my fear. Wasn't that your question in California? This is much more devotional, Vajrayana question, Peter. very interesting. Are you descending, you're trying to like fit in, or, you, or what? <laughs> yes, I remember. We were very nervous about you sitting up there in the mountain lion's cave. Um, only from a point of view of administrative costs. <laughs> Any questions? 
Like um, in Tibetan Buddhism, we chant this prayer 100,000 times. We don't sit there thinking about Northwest, which country is that? Is it Pakistan, Afghanistan, or Kazakhstan, or Swatfeld? We don't. You chant it 100,000 times, merging with, with the self-perfected principle, the lotus-born principle, the immaculate conceptions. Every concept, concept we have is immaculate conception. We think we're thinking it, but who started it? Did you really decide to think what you just thought? That's what we call immaculate conceptions. Lotus born. Well, it depends on you. Weaning map is uh, as Dzogchen lineage always do. It depends on you. In our monastery in Nepal and Darjeeling, in our three-year retreat, we always begin with this prayer. But it depends on you. Questions? Many general practitioners begin with the refuge or the bodhisattva vow or bowing or something in general. Questions, please. Well, we have a, we have a live corner over there. What's happening over in those seats? Could you please talk more about, could you please speak more about dualism? Oh, that's such an abstract subject. There's no such thing as dualism, really. Can you prime the pump a little? What, what are you thinking? What do you well, need? What I, do you need? Well, just about everything. Everything you mean, like what yeah, is I mean, dualism? I, I, what is dualism? Dualism yes, means two. The, yeah, I know God the, and man, separate. Yeah, Sep dualism then, means separation. So you're saying dualism does not exist. There is no. In the relative sense, there is. I'm just saying, let's not be dualistic about not about oneness. Dualism is fine because it's like if we say east and west, there's really not two skies. But from the point of view of, of our travels, it's good to know. So it's just a kind of like a relative construct. Yeah, it's exactly how Buddhism understands all dualisms. Relative okay. truth. It's true enough. It's called relative truth, conventional truth. Like me and you, I have to know the difference. Otherwise, you know, somebody has to lead me around and feed me like a person in a mental asylum, you know, who can't take care of themselves. You have to know the difference between you and the car and the mailbox. Otherwise, you don't know which mouth to put the food in when you're hungry. <laughs> Like crazy people get, you know, really crazy. Okay, thank you. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. Right. Thank you. So good and bad is also relative. We have touched on this, was it last night or this morning? The steep Buddhist statement, there's nothing unequivocally good or bad. There's only the wanted and the unwanted. That's a very steep statement. And you might, the inner lawyer might say, objection, what about, you know. But you can fill in the blank and try to th and question it. It's worth thinking about. So this is more of an absolute practice. This is more of the non-dual awareness practice. Of course, it's couched in the relative world. We all live here. We all live, we have bodies. So, you know, we are in the, the world of differentiation, dualism, differentiation, the one in the many, dif diverse differentiation, me and you and six billion humans and other told billions of other kinds of beings, insects and animals and all. So we live in that world, so you know, it's very important to know which side of the road to drive on. You can't just say it doesn't matter. But you also can't say it's absolutely true you have to drive on the right side of the road. Who could say that? Anybody? Do we have to drive on the right side of the road? In England, they drive on the wrong side, of, I mean left side of the road. You see, this is relative truth, and if you go deeper, or higher into the hierarchy of values, you start to see many values are like that, including you know, regarding action. So it's often said intention is more important than action regarding karma. We all know the saying, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, yes. But also, let's not ignore that the same action may have different karmic consequences depending on your intention. Like sticking a knife into somebody's chest at midnight might have very different karmic implications for a surgeon as for a burglar, a mugger, a murderer. Same action, different karmic result, different state of mind involved. Even if the patient dies, the surgeon doesn't have the same karma as the mugger, because he's trying to help. He's, he or she is staying up all night trying to help. 
questions? So that's why I say let's not be dualistic about dualism. In the realm of dualism, we have to be very discriminating between this and that. Prajna is a sharp sword that can discriminate between helpful and harmful, skillful and unskillful. We shouldn't be dualistic about dualism. That's why there's really no dualism. Doing what you have to do is the, is the way of entering into the dreamlike, the, the play of, du of duality. Excuse me. Not discriminating between sacred and mundane. Yes? I think this follows on from that. You said, um, sometimes you say things that just, you know, pop out. I don't know what to do with them. Don't scratch me with your mustache, merge with me. This That's just blowing my mind. Oh, good. Well, then I won't explain it. <laughs> Well, the Lotus Guru has a mustache, so what I'm saying is, is like, don't let anything between us, like imagining that he looks like this or that. What if, I mean, what if you don't like men? You know, he's not a, ma a man. It's a guru archetype. It's like God. Don't, don't tickle me with your beard, merge with me. I don't want a beard between us, or a body, or a gender or an ism. That's what I was thinking. So it's not other. Yes, well said. You see, we need to hear more from you guys. Well, you, well, you always want me to be the answer man. So since our time's up, now I can, you know, I don't have to be on your clock. I can follow my interest and say, I would like to hear what you said, whose name I don't remember, from Open Spirit Learning Alliance, what you would say to that woman, since you have deep experience of this, you volunteered that you wanted to share something about how she could deal with her pain. Please share with us now, now that my um, session is over. Thank you. And, um, What's your name, by the way? Joelle. Joelle, that's right. I know you, but <laughs> it's okay. Thank you. Nice to see you. Thank you. Um, I, I also wish to share that it was a, a good lesson for me that you did not allow me to respond right away. But that, that w might take too long, so I just want to say that it was perfect. Um, anyway. <clears throat> yeah, I'm doing this more for her than for you. You yeah. already got your teaching no, I, I of was letting a, go. I was really intending to help her. Anyway, so um, the first thing that helped me is to realize that the pain is the temporary teacher. And then to recognize the fear and the resistance as soon as it shows up. Because usually, as soon as the pain, well, I'm speaking for myself, this is what happened to me. As soon as the pain shows up, the fear and the resistance shows up. And so recognizing the fear and the resistance, being aware of that, <clears throat> and accepting the pain as the teacher. The pain is going to be here until you learn what it's supposed to teach you. And so accepting it as the teacher. Um, and then the, this realization, uh, I, I read this incredible affirmation that helped me and that I adapted. Uh, and I'm going to try to remember it. Um, I have a body, but I'm not the body. I like, I love my body, and I thank my body for supporting me, but I'm not the body. And you could then choose to say, I am the soul, or I am Buddha, or I am unchanging awareness, noticing perceptions, arising, unfolding, and dissolving. And then because emotions are always involved with pain, you can say, I have emotions, or I have an emotional body. But I'm not the emotions. I thank my emotional nature, and I love my feeling nature, for feeling my life through. But I'm not these emotions. I am the soul, or I am unchanging awareness, noticing, you know, noticing what's going on. And then the mind is also involved with all of that, so you can say, I have a mind, but I'm not this mind. I love my mind, and I thank my mind for thinking through me, but I'm not this mind. I am the soul, or I am unchanging awareness, 
noticing perceptions arising, unfolding, and dissolving. And you may like to add also the acknowledgement, if it helps you, it helped me, this realization that you're not separate from the solution, you're not separate from anything. Separation is the ultimate illusion, or suffering, the cause of suffering. So, <clears throat> I am one with the Buddha, I am one with spirit, I am one with the source that created me. <clears throat> anyway, thank you, this is what helped me. Thank you, Joel. I think that's relevant to all of us who have pain and suffering, which is endemic to the human condition. We'll give you a gong for that. <laughs>